1994, Nigerian writer and activist Wole Shoyinka escaping impending arrest for having opposed the military government. A life in exile started, remote opposition, and writing beautiful words that earned him the Nobel Prize of Literature. In this documentary, we explore the journey that Shoyinka undertook from being a village boy that didn't want to achieve anything to becoming called the conscious of the nation of Nigeria. November 1994, Nigerian writer and activist Wole Shoyinke is on the road fleeing from impending arrest ordered by Nigerian dictator Sani Abati. General Abacha had seized power just a year ago in a coup d'etat and was tightening his grip on the country. The general imposed drastic economic reforms that dramatically increased Nigeria's economic growth, but at the cost of blatant corruption and gross human rights violations. Any resistance to the regime was muzzled by force. And Wale Shoyinka, as co-founder of the underground opposition, had dared to oppose Abacha by calling for international sanctions. Now, more than 25 years later, Wale Shoyinka still has vivid memories of this ordeal. I had to accept the fact that maybe I was the only one of the entire movement against Abacha's dictatorship who could create an alternative voice, radio voice accepted the fact that I had to leave the country. Shoyinka had every reason to escape. The Abacha regime was known for killing anyone standing up against them. Even the fact that Shoyinka was already a Nobel Prize winning writer would not have saved him. The hasty journey started by car from his home. I was in Abeokuta when it became clear that the chips were down. I either leave or get captured. So I, um, I got in the car, pretended I was on a hunting trip. And so even though there were soldiers, um, roadblocks and so on everywhere, they recognized me and actually passed through some of those roadblocks and um, got al went along the smuggler's route to Iseng and the, the, the crossing of the main river to the Republic of Benin. The journey concluded in the United States from where Shoyinka managed to found the shortwave clandestine radio Kudirat, offering a voice for the oppressed opposition in Nigeria. This is Radio Kudirat, Nigeria, the voice of democracy. Wale Shoyinka had left his ancestral Yoruba land in southwest Nigeria where he was born on the 13th of July, 1934, in the town of Abeokuta. He was raised in the neighborhood called Ake. Shoyinka describes his young years in the 1981 memoirs Ake, the years of childhood. In Ake, Shoyinka also mentions his St. Peter's primary school that still exists but the building that had Wallace classrooms is being demolished. 
Shoyinka's father used to be the head teacher here. He says that his parents have sown the seeds for his life as a writer and activist by often debating about Nigeria's British colonial rulers. I grew up in, uh, in a community family environment in which uh, the sense of nationalism was quite strong. My uncles, my parents they used to argue quite a lot, this discussion was going on. And so there were manifold aspects of viewing our condition. And I was bombarded as a curious child, I was a very curious child. I was bombarded with many aspects, different aspects of that. Wole Shoyinka's secondary school, the Abeokuta Grammar School, is also mentioned in Ake. It, in the meantime, became the seat of the Bishop of the Anglican Church in Nigeria. The Bishop says that the young Wole was befriending members of the Ransom Kuti family in Nigeria, who were all respected here in Yoruba land. This family produced the influential Nigerian women's rights activist Fumila Ransom Kuti and her son Fela, who was a famous musician and activist. Wallace shared rooms with his cousin Fela, and through him, he got further in touch with the Ransom Kuti family. They were role models for him because. The Ransom Kutis were very principled, very educated, very principled, and they produced generations of leaders in this country as far as educational training is concerned. So the academic erudition of Wale Shonika, the cultivation of his academic virtues, his strength, was built here. In this environment, Shoyinka was encouraged to read a lot. It made him become a writer, although he says he didn't intend to. I suppose along the way, I sort of thought, well, I'm reading about all these people, all these strange characters and so on. And I began to put my own characters in place of what I read. So it was a kind of gradual process. I don't think I just woke up one day and said, as a result of an experience, I have to be a writer. At least I don't recall it. Wale Shoyinka accepted his remarkable talent for writing and took it to the University of Ibadan, where he went to study English. There, he founded the Pirates Confraternity, campaigning against corruption and injustice. It was the first confraternity in Nigeria and can be seen as Shoyinka's emerging activism. Shoyinka believes he was infused with activism at a young age, seeing poverty around him, just like his writing stumbled into it. It's a, it's a strange process, I suppose, is that in spite of, shall we say, the progressive nature of my parents, my relations, that I also saw early enough contradictions, contradictions, let's say among my siblings, my schoolmates and so on. I saw the, the disparity between their social conditions and my own, which was privileged. All these various yeah, observations, hints, actualities observed coalesced progressively uh, towards um, feeling that I, is mo it was the most natural thing to try and at least obviate these contradictions, inequalities within society. His activism didn't stop Shoyinka from writing. He went to study English in the United Kingdom and there he wrote plays for the groundbreaking Royal Court Theatre in London. He went back to Nigeria after graduating in 1960. Shoyinka returned in the middle of the country's celebration of independence from England.
Before that, Shoyinka wrote the play A Dance of the Forests, in which he dared to question the benefits independence was supposed to bring. The play was therefore not received well, but Shoyinka says he could not just jubilate the country's liberation from the colonial yokes. I found that uh, there was as much to celebrate as to deplore, as to be apprehensive about in the approaching future. In the years after, Shoyinka demonstrated a growing militancy. He invaded a radio station in Ibadan in 1964, protesting against fraud during local elections. This got Shoyinka in prison for the first time. But he continued criticizing politicians and power, like in the 1965 Congis harvest that is about an African dictator staging a coup. When the next in line drops his hand upon the monarch's mouth, it is time for him to take to finance. It made Shoyinka's fame grow, and he was somehow automatically given access to the political leaders at the time. In 1967, he secured a meeting with rebel commander Ojuku, hoping to avoid the Biafra war, but he failed. A bloody war broke out that lasted until 1970. Interfering with state affairs got Shoyinka in prison again, for two years in solitary confinement. To keep busy, he was writing notes on pieces of paper that were smuggled in. They formed the base of his 1971 prison memoirs. This prison experience hardened Shoyinka, but he kept publishing critical plays and novels. Among the most famous works of Wole Shoyinka are his 1959 play, The Lion and the Jewel, about the value of Nigerian traditions versus European innovation. Why then? Why don't you sit down and listen? Throughout his work, Shoyinka always chooses themes related to the use and abuse of power. His oeuvre in 1986 earned him the Nobel Prize for Literature. The jury appreciated Shoyinka's ability to write beautiful words and strong stories based on his apprehension against injustice in society. Wole Shoyinka in his Nobel period was mostly writing plays following the oral tradition of the Yoruba but he also used the structure of classic Greek drama. The combining of indigenous and European literary cultures distinguished Shoyinka from other African writers of his time. The style itself is in line with Yoruba storytelling, rich in wordings and abundant of metaphors. This particular style was observed by Professor Adodekun of the University of Ibadan, who has studied Wale Shoyinka for 50 years and is a great admirer. My conclusion about Shoyinka, as I told you, that he's a semi-god. It's like we can compare him with Shakespeare. We can compare him, as I said, with the Eschelos, Sophocles, in the magnitude of his language, which is not even accessible to the intellectuals. After the Nobel Prize, a global journey of public performances started and writing even more. But that was until 1994, 
when Shoyinka felt he had to leave everything behind to escape from General Abacha. To get away alive from General Abacha in 1994, Shoyinka had to abandon a life. An act that might be symbolized by having left alone his collection of statues that belonged to Shoyinka's Yoruba culture. The Yoruba live in the southwest of the country. Their culture is best represented through a society of statues embodying the gods and forces belonging to their pantheistic religion. The Yoruba belief carries the virtue of improvement of society and oneself through meditation and study. This developed into a sophisticated set of rituals and norms for human conduct. This helped the Yoruba to become an economical and political force in Nigeria up to the present day. Shoyinka being raised in Yoruba land had absorbed this culture, but in order to survive, he had to leave it all behind. I said to myself, all right, you've enjoyed all these, now just abandon them. But right now, the situation is such that they're in fact no longer yours because you are not in a condition of freedom in which you appreciate, you associate with them that they're part of your life. From abroad, Shoyinka continued his opposition against Abacha in hiding, fearing for Abacha's secret foreign operatives. And in 1995, Shoyinka saw his worst fears confirmed by the hanging in Nigeria of his friend and fellow writer activist, Ken Sarawiwa, under General Abacha's orders. Ken Sarawiwa, just like Wally Shoyinka, had dared to oppose Abacha by campaigning against the government enforced oil extraction in the Niger Delta. And on the 10th of November 1995, Ken Sarawiwa paid the ultimate price for that when he was executed. For Shoyinka, this was a double shock since Ken Sarawiwa a few years earlier had sought advice from him on a document vowing for better rights for the affected tribes in the Niger Delta. We met in Stockholm, for instance, he was coming from the United Nations, where he'd uh, been agitating for the recognition of the Ogoni yes. as one of the threatened indigenous uh, tribes. He'd been to see me in Abeokuta, by the way, with his son, they came in a small delegation, with the Kaima Declaration. And uh, I promised that I would do whatever, you know, good, at the time that I backed it wholly, uh, the rights of the indigenous people. This was the last time Shoyinka had seen Ken Sarawiwa, and the execution made Shoyinka deeply disappointed and angry. The killing of Kansar did two things. One, on the one hand, it frankly made me um, despair of the possibilities, the potentiality of power as such. Power is something I've always engaged myself in intellectually, in essays and so on. But to see the ruthlessness, the brutality of power exercised on the, the veneer of state legitimacy crystallized my struggle also in ways which I yeah, hadn't suspected. It, it just meant for me um, a, a declaration of war against humanity by a bunch of psychopaths. 
Shoyenka continued his struggle from abroad by publishing in favor of the opposition in Nigeria. It would take until 1999 before he would return to Nigeria when dictator Abacha died and civilian rule was restored. Nigeria was on its knees for him because of his continuous voice of opposition. He was even offered a bid for the 1999 presidency, but according to his former personal assistant Tunde Awosamni, he refused. His reason was that one, he, could, he, he does not have the temperament for regimented living. Okay, becoming president would make him to become regimental. Wole Shoyinke was treated as a pan-African hero of liberation and became an example for the generations after him. Among them are filmmakers, students, writers and theatre directors. There is Toyin Oshinaike, who focuses on plays of Wole Shoyinke like King Babu, inspired by Abacha from 2001. So many people have um, seen what's been happening in the country and I have not been able to put them in a play, like a reportage in a play. And the, he has done that. Most other plays that you find is about the social African life, but he writes more about the political um, um, climate of, 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 of our society. I will not make any journey. Yeah. Right? That is not yet. There is Odia Ofeimun, who became a poet after having gotten approval from Shoyinka by paying him a visit and presenting his work. Looked at them and, and asked, are you sure you wrote them? Frankly, I wasn't looking very, very decent in a university sense because I was dressed like a factory lover. I had a shirt tied by my navel and I was wearing the trim slippers. So I was, it, I was just like anybody off the street. He, which was why he had to ask the question, are you sure you wrote them? From that moment, I knew I could call myself a poet because it meant that he liked the poems I brought. In retrospect, one can say that Wale Shoyinka, despite his writing style, created himself a global presence. And inside Nigeria, he became a voice to be recognized. And especially in an economic powerhouse like Nigeria, with its deep divide between rich and poor and tension between Christianity and Islam, there is always something to argue about. And Wale Shoyinka is always on the forefront to give his comments. Not because he wants to, but he says he has to. People don't believe me, but I'm really a glutton for tranquility. I'm really a closet, tranquil person. The problem I have is that my tranquility is disturbed by the unacceptable. If I, and so I would say that what people call activism is just, perhaps just a selfish uh, form of um, existence, of intervention, that I want to get back to my peace of mind, my tranquil state. And therefore, when there are events, circumstances, forms of conduct in society, no matter who's responsible, which disturb my tranquility, then I have to do something about it. So I hope you that. And Shoyinka is now looking at being cherished wherever he goes. Although that made him ambivalent. There are moments when it's, it's good to be recognized. But think of the interruption of your private life. Think, think of the, how the, balloon, uh, the constituency balloons when all you're thinking of is getting back into, your, into those private moments where you can create or just do absolutely nothing. But Shoyinka didn't choose to fade away quietly in his mansion on the countryside. And recently, Shoyinka is being seen disturbed.
by the attacks in Nigeria by the extremist Boko Haram. Boko Haram, this is something which has to be exterminated. I mean, without any compromise, you know, this is not a period for political correctness. It's a period in global, uh, global existence of intolerance of the intolerant. Those who are not tolerant, we should be intolerant towards them. And according to people around Shoyinka, he will continue to raise issues. And for that, he already received the attribution of being the conscious of the nation. Shoyinka happens to be a national a, 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 producer, a producer of national conscience in the sense that he has, he has spoken on all issues and he takes positions that are not necessarily of an economic nature but has been able to stand as a moral, a, a moral conscience in a way that very few other people have been. And even though being born in 1934, he's not likely to stop. I don't see him fully retiring. I don't see him fully retiring. Because uh, the only thing, the only punishment you can give him is to tell him to stop working, is to cause him to stop working. And I don't see him as somebody who, who is ever going to stop working. Wallace's son Olaokun agrees with this but hopes that people realize what they're demanding from him. People send me letters and they invite him to this event that is going to make... You know, you know, I look at it and I think, that's not considerate. He's going to have to travel for... make such an effort and travel and, and put up with so much at, as, at 81. You know, you should have considered that it's time to reduce the, the pressure on him to, to be everywhere at once. And he keeps creating by publishing and raising his voice when he deems necessary. And retirement? That's an academic issue. I even made the mistake of announcing publicly once that I was retiring. And then I had to swallow my words and say, oh no, what I should have said is that I am now a, a student of retirement and that I, will, I may graduate this year, and then I'll do my postgraduate next year, and eventually I'll do my PhD in retirement, by which time I'm probably gone. That's what I, I cope with it. Yeah.